Well, hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ada Fang, and I am a senior at Brown studying biology and German. Um, I'm also one of the co-presidents of the Brown German Club, and today I have the great pleasure of welcoming to campus our honored guest speaker, Jagna Marinich. Um, I first came across her name uh, earlier this summer when we were planning our German Campus Weeks, um, which is an initiative supported by the German Embassy in Washington, D.C. And the theme that they put forth for us this year was Germany meets the U.S. And, of course, this is a very broad theme, but we decided ultimately that um, this fall, one of the most relevant and pressing topics uh, facing both our countries today belongs to the dialogue of immigration and integration. Um, especially what that looks like within both of our countries. Um, so in pursuing this angle, we considered the embassy suggestions, uh, one of which was workshop with author Jagoda Marinich. And I remember doing some research online and being very, very thoroughly impressed with her work. She is a German author and journalist who has earned wide recognition for her writings about themes of identity, migration, citizenship, and integration in Germany and also across Europe. She has earned her degree from Heidelberg University, studying German literature, American literature, and political science. And she joins us in the US from Heidelberg, where she is the founding director of the Heidelberg Intercultural Center. Her most recent book, entitled Made in Germany, Was ist Deutsch in Deutschland, explores the current socio-political climate in Germany in light of the recent immigration and current refugee crisis. As I'm sure you're aware, um, this is a topic that has been featured very prominently in the U.S. politics as well. And so, of course, I asked our faculty advisor, Jane Sokolowski, if it would be possible to uh, invite Jagna Maric to speak to us at Brown. So I'm thrilled that she is able to join us today and deliver her talk, The American Dream, A Dream Turned German. And I encourage you to stick around afterward and ask questions, as well as to attend her reading tomorrow at 6 p.m. in the Kasser Fox Auditorium. Um, throughout her talk here, you can also feel free to share photos and tweets using the hashtag Marinich Meets Brown. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jagoda Marinich. So here I am. I always feel like they're too short somehow or too far away. Um, good evening. I'm very happy to be here and to join you and to have this conversation with you which is a transatlantic conversation, as you know. It is two continents talking together. And I'm speaking here as a German writer who has Croatian parents, so born to Croatian parents. You might be familiar with the story of former Yugoslavia, which is a country that fell apart due to war. And my parents were not affected by that. They came to Germany as immigrant laborers in the 70s, so a long time before the war started. and. Um, I have strongly felt that the older my parents got, the more forgotten their stories would be. So part of um, what brought me out as more of a public intellectual with these topics is also to make sure that the heritage of certain people who did not have a loud voice in Germany um, is not forgotten. Yet um, I have not focused too strongly on this biographical aspect of my writing about these topics. I think we live in quite turbulent times. I'm coming here during an election campaign that is broadly discussed in Germany, and we are really worried and um, yeah, checking online what's going on, what's the latest thing Trump has said that he shouldn't have said, what is uh, the latest thing Wikipedia has released about Hillary that um, we don't want to know, but yet we want to know. And so it's, yeah, it's a turbulent time. Um, so I'm very glad that you managed to organize to provide us with this opportunity to have a debate and a discussion which I think is very important for both of our democracies. So I am delighted to be back in the United States after I visited Davidson College last year to celebrate 25, year, 25 years of German unity, all with the help of the German Embassy in Washington, just like here tonight. They even asked if they can have our Twitter picture a few hours ago, so I think they are watching us, if we like that or not. Um, yeah, it is, to be honest, a very exciting moment for a European to visit the United States. I am curious to engage in a conversation with you here, not only because you will soon elect your president, but because this election to many of you here and to many of us there seems to cross some limits as to what we have expected a campaign to be about. There is blatant sexism, and yet it still doesn't stop the candidate. 
There is deep distru distrust against the establishment, and yet the political parties did not come up with somebody new who would build trust and move young people towards political engagement. To the contrary, the younger voters seem to be somewhere left behind in this campaign. It is a campaign that seems to cause collateral damage to a lot of democratic values. A democracy can only function well with public sphere uh, that gives enough space for argument-based debate and the issues that concern many. It is also very exciting to be here only one, only one year after my Davidson speech because the world, as I talked about it then, no longer exists. We seem to live in times that change so fast that the content of a speech given only last year has to be completely reversed. Last year, at about the same time I was visiting the States, there were images of Germany's open, Germans open-heartedly awaiting refugees at the station of Munich, for example and welcoming them. Pictures of deep humanity were broadcasted all over the world. Germans suddenly found themselves in the role of the good German, which later on was to some people a reason to accuse those who helped of a certain narcissism inherent in the German. Helping others. Helping others is a value that Christianity brought and kept alive in our societies. But in our times, though many fight for Christian values, helping people raises suspicion. The European countries that are most critical about taking refugees in are the ones who claim they are so, they are so because they are defending Christian values. As you can see, in the current atmosphere, important issues are being twisted and turned around in a way that demands a lot of the, a lot of the media and those who are supposed to be the interpreters of what is going on in the world. But let's go back to the images 12 months ago. Thousands of people left Hungary after they have been treated in an inhuman way. They left for Germany, a country they expected more of. Germans had just coined the term Willkommenskultur, a culture that should welcome people. It was not coined for refugees, but for immigrants Germany would need for its labor market and a stable demography that would ensure their pensions. But the German people, by waiting for the refugees at the stations, made this term Willkommenskultur applicable to this situation. All of a sudden, Chancellor Merkel, who was formerly known as rather, um, rather hard approach, um, allowed people to make selfies with her, something she was seriously criticized for afterwards. She doesn't let them make selfies anymore. Why did the refugees in Hungary believe they would have better chances in Germany? After all, the first line of the German constitution reads, Die Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar. It means, translated, something like, the dignity of a human being is something one cannot touch. Or to put it in the way it sounds familiar here, certain human rights are unalienable. Oh, oh. So the lady has skipped my page three when she printed it out in the hotel. Hmm. Well, let me just check. That's what you want to happen when you come to the United States in River Speech. But um, mainly what I was um, pointing at, at, at page three that is now lacking is that certain the, the the idea that certain human rights are unalienable and that we have come to a point where we discuss whether they are human rights or whether they are the rights of certain citizens you have maybe heard the terms fortress europe which means we will care of the citizens in europe but we cannot care for 65 million people all over the world who are fleeing and at war who are suffering from climate change and its um, results. So we have come to a moment where many people in Germany wonder whether something that was um, the idea of that you cannot touch a, hu a, a human being's dignity, an idea that was um, written into our constitution by the people after the Second World War can be actually relevant in nowadays, today. They say that we have 65 million people who are refugees 28 million of them are children. So is Germany or Europe supposed to help all of them? 
So actually, we are at the, at the moment where the universal rights are questioned, where we say we have human rights, but are they as universal, or do they just belong to certain cit uh, citizens, to certain countries, and um, to the, um, yeah, so there's a fight going on between those who say it's a, it's a universal principle. If we have these standards, we have to apply them to the world. And between those who say, no, it's actually something like a national principle. You know, it belongs to the European, to the Germans, to the citizens of the US, but it doesn't belong to people from Syria, to people from Somalia, to people from all over the world who are at war. It's not our war, though we are deeply intertwined into their conflicts and into their um, problems. So, um, so now we go on. But now, one year after Germany welcomed the refugees and provided them with shelter, Chancellor Merkel was verbally abused in public. Xenophobes took their chance to get broadcasted, and they wanted to show Germany's ugly face to the world. They succeeded. What I'm talking about is the celebration of the German unity only two weeks ago, something we are celebrating here, too, with this um, uh, week's we had um, uh, we always celebrate that. We, this year we celebrated it in Dresden, which you might have heard of has serious problems with uh, right uh, wings politicians and a very right extremist scene. So when we had all those politicians entering the building where we wanted to celebrate, there was this crowd of people who were yelling really ugly stuff at Merkel, really ugly start stuff at all our politicians, and actually made this day of German unity. Um, a day that did not st speak about German unity, but about German division. And I personally thought it was a real disaster to have after one year. That's why I say I can't speak anyhow like last year, because last year we had these images, and this year, two weeks ago, we have Germans almost spitting at our chancellor and saying, you know, you are the one who destroyed this country. And this is like how, how much has changed in only one year. So um, these people are protesting in a verbally and sometimes physically aggressive manner that reminds many people of an atmosphere that was around pre-World War I in 1913. One should try to paint the bigger picture yet. So I want to add to this that one out of ten German citizens are still helping refugees. There are still nine million Germans volunteering to make the world a better place in Germany, to make things work. The famous quote of Angela Merkel was actually copy-pasted from Barack Obama. Yes, we can, she turned into Wir schaffen das. For 12 months, Germany was discussing whether it can do it or cannot. Today, as you can tell from the numbers I just told you, Germany has decided it cannot do that much. We have taken in less than 300,000 refugees this year, and compared to last year, it's visible that we have made a political turn, that actually we're trying to somehow help some people, but not um, overburden Germany, as some felt it, we were doing so. Um, to be fair, Germany has done a lot, and the other European countries did not follow Merkel's lead. The media have supported her stand, calling her the most important leader of Europe. But this leader, once she turned around, was left alone on her way to the top. It was not only the Eastern European countries, of which many think they have simply not learned to handle diversity due to their past. In, it mainly some, because mainly some unimaginable, something unimaginable happened. The country that was the European role model of multiculturalism for decades broke apart from Europe. After Brexit, really everybody understood what is currently at stake, Europe itself. A whole history of politics of integration within Europe, a politics of unity, of open borders, a policy that was designed to bring peace and wealth to European citizens after two disastrous wars that has left nations in difficult relationships with each other. In 2016, just one year after my last visit, a European Union as we knew it last year does not exist anymore. What used to be unthinkable when we were t dealing with the Greek crisis, the Grexit, is suddenly real with one of the founding countries of Europe, Great Britain. One should not leave unmentioned that ever since the Brexit there has happened, there has been more xenophobic violence in Britain. So xenophobia is conquering a continent 
of which many thought it had learned its lessons. In 2016, Germany suddenly has a far-right political party, Alternative für Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, whose leaders don't mind throwing all sorts of ideas to the public that have not been discussed publicly since Nazi Germany. Like, for example, using words like Völkisch, a word that the Nazis had deeply abused to create a, people, a national identity for its people that was founded on the stigmatization of others. Some of us cannot believe that in 2016 we are provided such a backlash in the political discourse. Last year, the students at Davidson were mostly full of admiration for Germany. Let's call them the new Germans. There was something going on nowadays and that didn't seem connected to the Germany's dark past, as if a country had, thor as if a country had thoroughly reinvented itself. It was not only Angela Merkel who made the decision to let almost one million people in. There were also many Germans who agreed with the Chancellor's decision. Germany had to take a stand. Nobody wanted images of violence against refugees on German borders. Last year, there were students asking about what had happened in Germany, why people were not xenophobic but humanitarian, why they were not racist but pacifist. It was maybe the first time in my life that I was to experience deep admiration for the country that we call Germany. One could feel that particularly young people do need a vision of humanity, something that helps them to open up to the world because we have values, and not to shut down because it is simply too much. To live in the world is simply too much. The longing of people that the world should be understandable, manageable, handleable, was to be felt last year. As much as I would like to provide such clarity to problems um, is that I can't, I really can't. We have no politicians, activists, philosophers who can create order in the mess that was created in the last decades. Last week, while preparing the speech, the German police in the city of Chemnitz and Berlin were organizing a razzia for Jaber al bakr I hope I'm spelling it right, a young Syrian man who came to Germany and gained refugee status. He was not a radical then. He was, the type of the mo he was the type of refugee the most Germans welcome to have here, from Syria, well educated, he's a doctor. Now he turns out to be an agent of ISIS, radicalized not back home but in Germany. As I started writing this speech, the police has still not managed to arrest him. When I, re re when I revised the speech, the following had happened. The terrorist had found shelter in the home of three other Syrian refugees and was hiding there from the police. In the meantime, the police translated some information about him uh, for Syrian communities and social media, describing the terrorist al-Bakr. Al the three guys who had taken him back home realized that they were actually helping a terrorist. They arrested him and handed him over to the police. And the day before I'm about to start to leave to the US, the young terrorist had committed suicide in the prison. It is now a scandal for those who should have watched him. The police is under attack. Three Syrian refugees are the heroes of the story, while one Syrian refugee was an agent of ISIS, radicalized not back home but in Germany. As you can see, the world in 2017 is not easy to deal with. It's not as easy as Justin Trudeau suggested when he answered the question why his cabinet is so diverse, and he said, because it's 2015. It actually sounds quite easy, but it isn't. In a matter of just one year, Germany has changed its refugee policy. Germany has in just one year developed a right-wing party that is very likely to become part of our parliament during the next election. Judging from a human rights perspective, it is unbearable to shut off borders when you know that while you are safely home, somebody else's life is at stake while he's knocking at your closed doors. On the other hand, the safety of Europe has been tremendously tested. French and Belgian people know best what I talk about. The complexity of talking about helping people and the same time being threatened by throwing horses can hurt your, that can hurt your own people has become an immense challenge to German politics and to European politics. But we must not forget that many of those radicalized to terror terrorism grow up within Europe. It's Europe's own children, too, 
who have lost their ground. It seems like German politicians have so far not found the right answers for many of these voters. Or to put it the other way around, the political right has so far found some answers, and it's new voters. Many Germans who haven't voted in decades now vote for the right. Millions of people welcomed refugees to Germany last year. Millions are still helping on a voluntary basis, but millions have also voted this year for the Alternative für Deutschland. I will try to put that in perspective, too, by saying that even if 15% of the German voters vote for the AfD, it is still 85% of German voters who, in spite of the strenuous last year, still have not voted for a right-wing party. And still, having a right-wing party of that type in Germany is deeply worrying, because Germany is a leader in Europe, because many countries rely on the integrity Germany had developed by working through its history. The culture memorizing and working through your shadowed paths is something that has helped Germany to regain trust from its neighbors. Until now, Germany has been the only influential European country whose parliament did not have to deal with a political party on the right. The right parties Germany knew so far were NPD and Rep the Republicans, the Republicano, not your Republicans. <laughs> um, Parties that were understood to be so far on the right that no average German conservative could consider voting for them. But since the Alternative für Deutschland, again, she dismissed the page. Did she do that regularly? <laughs> okay, I have to somehow check a second. Excuse me. She has, um, she has somehow, um, because I didn't have a printer with me in the plane, and she has somehow done it for me, the, the nice lady at the front desk. So she has just brought a little disorder into my German. It's OK. There we are. 10. OK, but she has lost my page 8. OK, she forces me to speak without paper. So there I go. Um, Seven, eight. But since the Alternative for Deutschland, oh well, but these were three important things I wanted to say. Hmm. Well, then let's try it without the paper again. <laughs> so, it's um, I. What I want to say is I have three reasons. Whereas I don't know which ones exactly because I lost the paper. But um, I argue that some people think um, it's times where we have to worry a little more or a little less. But I want to argue that it's a time to really wake up because there's things going on that have not been going on ever since I'm alive. We have never um, had politicians who were shamelessly trying to make uh, things um, normal that we considered unnormal all the time, using words that we did not use. Like, I mean, I think you have similar things going on in the United States, but I will come back to that later. And um, what I argue for is that we have to wake up is because if we allow politicians to publicly speak in such a violent way that we consider this violence normal, what we enhance is terrorism on both left and right sides. It's that verbal violence actually releases all the violence on the extremist sides and people feel entitled to somehow um, do justice to the words of the right or left radical positions. And I think we have to all work on a public atmosphere where we focus on the argument and argument-based discussion, where we stop looking at politicians who actually lead power plays instead of real debate. When we watch even now the debates of Hillary and Trump, we have, we have talked about that, you don't feel that it's actually arguments they're exchanging. It's more like who's the, it's like, like when you're in the schoolyard and who's being meaner to the other and who should you applaud for having the better, uh, you know, the better answer to, to something mean the other one said. So we are actually losing the very fundamental um, basis of what a democracy is built on. The, the fact that we have arguments we believe in, that we exchange them, and that politics should be about moderating all these arguments, finding a compromise that gives us the ability to act on them. And I think we tend to forget them. Politics has now become a, like me against you. It's not you and me and we find like 
the, the common ground. And on this common ground, we build a society and make it stronger and give people the feeling they're building on something good. Now we have come into a very sp um, split moment where societies think democracy is about fighting the other. It's about winning over the other, and that it's not. So in allowing our politicians and our media to pretend that this is democracy and democratic debate, we are actually risking the peace that we have in our life. I have read that Watson Institute is also concerned about peace and civic engagement, and I think it's a good to pl place to remind us of this. The third thing is that we are l also living in a time, I write for newspapers, and there is less and less country where journalists can really practice free speech. There's less and less countries where you are safe stating your opinion. Free journalism is at risk. So it's not like things are, we once thought that liberal democracy will like conquer the world and everything is going to be fine. We live in a time where we actually things are going backwards. And um, there seems to be the necessity of very strong leaders around, strong in the sense of authoritarian. Authoritarian leaders are the big opponent of the liberal democracies we have come to enjoy. In Poland, they just managed to stop a law that would criminalize young women when they decide about their own bodies. Nationalism is growing stronger with nationalist leaders who don't work to integrate Europe, but to weaken the union. A union that has many flaws, from its legitimacy to its bureaucracy, but that was a peace project at first. We have lost the leaders of the last decades who all agreed due to their experience of the world wars on a strong Europe. We have lost what seemed to be unimaginable during the Greek financial crisis, one of the core European countries, Great Britain. So let's look a closer at the rhetoric of the new right. We'll have to go back to Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who certainly didn't do his best to do justice to the diversity of his country back then. Chancellor Kohl had one paradigm, he wanted a rich and stable country. He thus tolerated immigrants as workers, but he didn't accept them as citizens, nor did he desire to naturalize them. They were supposed to be invisible guests, the silent machine that kept the German post-war Wirtschaftswunder running. He and his party had no policies for those people. When Rita Süßmuth, a colleague of his in the CDU, established a commission to work on integration and its laws, she didn't have much support inside her party. Why should Germany integrate people that are supposed to go back home? Why should the German state spend money on other countries' citizens, even though they pay taxes here? The idea of naturalization was ridiculous at first, because being German was a birthright, nothing one could acquire but something one is given by one's ancestors, full stop. Helmut Kohl, as a chancellor, never felt overtly responsible for immigrants, neither in terms of safety nor in any other. When in Solingen, a German city, a Turkish family was murdered, Chancellor Kohl did not attend the obsequies. His, his spokesman said, God knows what other important appointments he may have had. He did not want to spend his time on Beileidstourismus, which could be translated as a tourism of feeling pity for people. During the last 20 years, it was not okay to say certain things in public. It was not okay to speak of migrants as undesired or inferior. People could do that in their backyard and with their friends, but not publicly. Since then, Germany had come a long way. Citizenship can now be acquired by birth, even if your parents are not German. It can be acquired after eight years of a self-sustained life in Germany. President Gauck wanted to be the president of diversity. He celebrated immigrants as the ones who could express love for the country far easier than the native-borns due to their past and heritage. Chancellor Merkel said last year when she let the refugees in, if it is not, in times of crisis, allowed to give a helping hand, then this is not my country. Ten years ago, Germany had started to work on laws for immigration in order to make it easier to immigrate, to immigrate and work here. Integration politics all of a sudden was not the politics for the 20 million people who had moved to Germany and had to learn German during the last decades or were born here to immigrant parents. Integration policies, policy in the last years was designed to work on a diverse country, a country that would have a more democratic, more liberal, and more diverse setup. It was obviously 
It was obvious that Germany was learning from the American model of society, not only due to the demographic reasons, but also due to the fact that in school classes today, kids with an immigrant family history were in most cases the majority. This shows why the definition of what is German needs to be rewritten, in order for it to be applicable for more people. One could argue that things were not were going pretty easy. The American dream turned German, and the conservatives could do little against it. It was the future of Germany and the present of most German cities. So the German politicians had tremendously changed. What Chancellor Kohl did was unimaginable. Everybody would attend uh, a, 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 an, ev an event where we would appreciate and, 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 and speak to the families who had been wounded or murdered or whatever. But then, last year, almost a million refugees came in. The exact number is currently at 890,000, though illegal immigrants are not included in that number. The fear of the foreigners, though most of them in need, has turned the discourse into something unheard of, unheard of since the end of Second World War. Sure, Chancellor Kohl was never a chancellor for non-native Germans, but he would prefer to assure his voters that Germany is not an immigrant's country. He would not, on a regular basis, accuse immigrants directly. He also knew very well that he needed them for his economy. The AFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, our new right-wing party, has chosen a very different way. They make sure they accuse immigrants and stereotype them. They make sure they use people's anger about political correctness to set every correctness aside. They like to foster xenophobia. They like to provide easy-to-handle answers, as if you could shut down national borders and thus leave the world outside and with it all its problems. There was a huge scandal when the AFD frontwoman said that countries in some case have to protect themselves from refugees by shooting at them if they try to enter. Whenever they verbally cross borders like this, they soon withdraw. They have been misunderstood. They never meant it that way. But what happens is that limits are crossed, that defenseless people are violated by simply making treatments imaginable that dehumanize them and rip them of their human rights. Asylum in today's world is not a gift, but it is a right. We are born by chance into places that offer us peace. Germany's history is unimaginable without that right. If the German intellectuals had not found refuge in other countries during World War, they would not have been able to come back and rebuild their country. They would not have been able to come back and found one of the most admired and copied constitutions in this world, the German Grundgesetz. The Grundgesetz is admired simply because it acknowledges the darkest point a civilization can go to, without denying the people co-responsible of this the right to rebuild their country and with it a normal life. The Alternative for Deutschland pictures a democracy where certain nationalities are more values, valued than others, a country less liberal, less open-minded, less diverse, and simply less interesting, I'd say. The bad thing at the moment, too many people believe what they say. Too many people are not interested in the facts concerning the things they lie about. The anti-European movement is gaining power throughout Europe. It's paradoxically an international movement. It is paradox to, to say they are organizing themselves internationally to succeed with their nationalism. But the paradox is currently a European, a European reality. The European Union does have a problem with the legitimacy of its institutions and politicians. It does have a problem with transparency, credibility, and bureaucracy. A European Union's austerity policy that drove Greece to the edge of what seemed bearable inside its borders. Old people weeping in front of banks, hospitals, unable to provide the help people needed. These were third world, third world images in one of the oldest European countries. The same with Italy. When Italy was confronted with one million refugees coming in from the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Lampedusa, the north of Europe didn't care. Germany was glad about the European law that said refugees had to stay in the country they set foot in. Since Germany was nowhere near the European edges, it's a law quite safe for Germany. A lack of solidarity lies 
at the heart of the European crisis. The only solidarity people remember was a solidarity with the banks. They were too big to fail, as politicians would be, wouldn't be tired of repeating. When in Greece, old people wept in front of these banks, those people were not too big to fail. They were the little man and woman, and they must have gotten the following message. Nobody cares for anybody anymore. A politics of austerity has left its traces on the European continent. In the south of Europe, almost 50% of the young generation have no jobs and no children. Is there a future for Europe? The fertility, late, the fertility rate is worse than ever. What we see is a continent that has no clue where to go and no idea how to play its global role, aside from being a tourist paradise. Fear has gotten a grip of the people. Fear to be standing in front of your bank and weeping after a long life of working for too little money. Amidst these fears, we have people who are far worse off, but the average human being is not St. Martin, who gives half of his coat and shares with the poorest. The average human being is trying to hamster his own belongings and is happy if he doesn't need anybody's help and no sharing. Against this kind of fear and thinking, the project of European integration was supposed to be a remedy. People, after having fought against each other in what was to be one of the worst wars in the history of mankind, were supposed to find trust in each other, to negotiate together, to do business together, to travel, to forgive. A continent that was once called the Dark Continent, Europe, grew to an extent that it opened its borders not only for free trade, but also to its inhabitants. Countries who had been fighting each other a few decades later came to form a European Union that would provide a market bigger than the United States. It succeeded. It seemed like it succeeded, but it did not provide the people with trust in its institutions. Europe is at stake because there is a revival of nationalism, there is a revival of anti-liberalism, there is a hostility against anything that has to do with liberal democracy, a hostility that against the protection of minorities which is the heart of every modern democracy, to, pre to protect the minorities from the tyranny of the, majorities, of the majority. So how will Germany sing its song? Germany was the country that was supposed to lead the European continent, both economically and morally. When Angela Merkel tried to find a European answer to the challenges of the conflicts in the Middle East, she was called the indispensable European but she was mainly isolated within Europe. Europe did not want Merkel's yes, we can. Europe did not want the humanitarian imperative of a priest's daughter. Now, after months of isolation, she doesn't want it either. She has a deal with Turkey that should help give her time till she gets re-elected. All the registration centers built for refugees are currently almost empty. Cities claim they can't handle more refugees anymore. Germany has done quite a big part of, her sh of its share, but it needs Europe to contribute. I have already explained how Germany turned from rejection of immigration to a country that has changed the citizenship laws for EU sanguinis into EU soli. The United States used to be the country people came to in order to live a better life. The, U the US was the country that had the narrative of the American dream. Suddenly, after Merkel's humanitarian fall in 2015, it seemed like a huge part of the world considered Germany was the country people wanted to immigrate to. Today, Germany is the country that has the second biggest number of immigrants worldwide, or people who want to come to Germany, right after the United States. But Germany, in its self-definition, is new on the field of diversity. It used to be a real Germans and a guest Germans country. Now the real Germans feel like they're losing their country to people who by no means can be as German as they are. And here we are suddenly in a very short time on the same ground as the United States. Paul Krugman has said at the Athens Democracy Forum of the New York Times that I attended this September, that the United States has become more nationalist, more European in that sense. Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, said 
that the campaign in the US is now more about race than economy. What did he mean? There is evidence that Obama's financial policies have been successful. People are better off and yet they fear to lose ground. Old white America has the feeling it is, it is losing its country. And maybe they are right, Krugman said. The US is changing. So the US have become more nationalist, more European, he argues. I would argue both ways. Europe has also become more American. Economically, the social welfare state Europe once knew, once knew is gone. When I was at school, it was a story from far away that people had two jobs but couldn't live of them. Now this is true even in Germany. I do not agree with Krugman that this is just a nationalist turn. It is also an economic problem that is misused by nationalists to regain power over an open society. It is the insecurity, the wealth gap, the fact that there is so much to have, but not for many, that makes people more vulnerable to finding scapegoats. Though they might be better off, the cities are excluding far more people from a normal life than before. Many people are aware that the main resources, our planet, are being exploited. Labor is still being exploited. You have an exhibition here at Brown, I was told, that I want to see. An exhibition about the 1%. You know what I'm talking about. If we all closely reread Darren Asimoglu, it will remind us why not sharing and protecting financial and intellectual elites have not contributed to the wealth of nations in the history of nations. It's the belief of the people that has to be restored, that people can trust in politicians, but also in each other and help each other. When I flew here, there was a, this Lufthansa magazine that you actually never really read on an airplane, but I did. I stumbled over the picture of an old man and looked at his open face. I will remind you of him, just as I, by reading this article about him, was reminded of him. His name was Gail Halferson, a pilot. When West Berlin was under siege, there were pilots who would deliver food and other things necessary to the people in Berlin. One man, Gail Halverson, would one day walk past kids and give them chewing gum. He saw how much joy it caused them and how respectful they treated his gift. He had no chance to see kids regularly, so he had the idea to throw the chocolate that the family back home sent him down to the kids so they could have the sweets. He kept doing this, silently, till one day the media covered the story and made it big. He was called to his boss's office and he said he thought the worst at that moment, that they would not let him fly anymore or something like that. But they instead saw that the power behind that gesture and congratulated him. From then on, pilots were throwing down sweets to the kids on little parachutes. The kids took the sweets and themselves in their free time played pilots who threw parachutes. Till today, I know old German people who believe in the US and that they wanted to the best for them because they remember the sweets they got in the times of darkness. It was the generosity and creativity of a single man. It was the genius of his boss to see the immense opportunity in this little human gesture, a chance for a nation starving and a nation bombing. Complex reality already back then. The airplanes that brought the sweets were nicknamed Rosinenbomber, bombs with raisins. This old man, who is now in the Lufthansa magazine, still bears witness that this world is capable of stories that move our hearts even in the darkest moments of history. We seem to be in dire need of these stories today, in dire need of these kind of people. I thank you all for listening, and I hope I can inspire you to go and search for yours and spread it and make people believe it so they can act and fight for the better in this time we live in. Thank you for listening.
cost of page, so uh, I would like a little more. Uh, I would like to hear a little more on the uh, similarities you drew between uh, the idea that human dignity cannot be touched and the idea of human rights being inalienable, inalienable, because I don't, I don't know how they translate into each other. Well, I think it comes down to the fact that is that we have um, developed human rights and that we consider them universal. So actually, the um, revolutionary idea that you cannot say human we invent human rights, but they are privilege. We invent human rights, and they are human. They are given to you by birth. So um, in a way, inalienable means you cannot lose them. They're always part of you. And if you say the dignity of a human being you cannot touch, that also means in a way that is something you can't lose. So both uh, ways to constitute uh, this is written in the institution. Both speaks of the idea of the universality of the human rights. That is not something we are given, but something we're endowed to by birth. And that we don't have to ask for any kind of governments to give it to us, but it is a human right. We're born with it. And so both constitutions try to find their own way to speak about this truth to their people. And in Germany, it's this sentence because what uh, Germany did to the Jews during the World War was taking away their dignity with this barbaric way of uh, murder. So um, the German constitution always refers to the, um, to the cruelties of the Second World War. I was I was thinking about the phrase "wake up" that you used, um, and it's I, I I was thinking about how waking up is often far right rhetoric that people have to wake up to what's going on, um, and so I was wondering how you would differentiate between the waking up that you're calling for and like the waking up that um, yeah far right groups are calling for. Yeah, I'm actually doing this because it's only the far right who's doing it. I'm uh, quite mad at the fact that the far right seems to be the better, um, fi seems to find the better way to talk to the masses. So I do believe that you can uh, fight for the same for our for the ideas that I stand for in a way that also appeals to people. So I wonder why um, some people manage to like uh, transmit hatred so easily because um, they find like a rhetoric that speaks to the people, while sometimes people who I think fight for a better world refuse that to themselves. They try to make it too complicated or, or pretend it's complicated, though it's not. In a way, we have very simple truths that we fight for. And um, I think what f wake up is also because in Germany, the fact is that the non-voters are now waking up and they vote for the right. So what can other people, parties, do to wake those up who are not voting and would like not vote for the right party? So I do think that... Um, what has to happen is that we have to understand that democracy is nothing that, um, like we, I was born into democracies. Most of you were born, maybe, I don't know about you, into democracy. So we consider this like the natural status quo, but democracy is being threatened both by this oligarchies and so many ways that people have no influence over the realities that form their life and shape their lives. So to me, I think it is very important that we don't leave the also the agitation to the rights, because they are like making the people nervous, and then the more nervous they get, then they get out and like, no, no, no we're going to stop them. But there's also serious re reasons to be nervous on the other side. If you care about the planet, if you care about um, like a social distribution of money and wealth, there's a lot of things you should be very worried about and not leave all the action. I was sometimes mad because I think there were studies uh, suggesting that always the more conservative people are somehow the less depressed, whereas the and, or and 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 I some, sometimes would love to combine like the more liberal and and, and left thinking and have it less depressed and um, just <laughs> do a little more action and not just sitting there and wondering what's the right f um, wording for everything, but just to take action. Yes, I, I liked what you said about this um, me me versus you instead of um, me plus you men mentality. Um, and I was wondering if you 
have any ideas of how we can create those spaces where we're building unity and working together in this political climate? And why do you think there exists this divisive nature and how, how can we bridge that and overcome that? Well, I think that there's something, that something happened to our communities that I think is quite dangerous because um, it's, yeah, right, because everybody seems to be um, around people who have the same mindset. So, so normally people used to go to sports or church and there were a lot of, you believed in God, but maybe you believed in many different things and had a very different point of view otherwise. So I feel that we are now more into particularism. Everybody has its own worldview and he f finds friends that he likes and that they find them with social media. So you mainly find peer groups that are always like you and have very little contact with people um, who are different and have different perspectives. So uh, there was a funny anecdote when I think it was um, George Bush running against Kerry, or one of those uh, last um, campaigns, and there was a joke s like saying, you know, I'm sure Kerry is going to win because I know I know nobody who's who's voting for George Bush, you know. So and this happens to all of us. We are just uh, friends with people who have the same mindset. It seems intolerable to be a friend with somebody who would so somehow say, I think I like Trump. You know, it's like you know, I'll unfriend him on Twitter. You know, or to, to talk to somebody who is against uh, helping refugees, you would immediately say, well, he's a bad human being, I don't want to be uh, friends with him. So uh, we have come all become a little more radical on that. And I think it has to do with the fact that those big community spaces that we used to have in our societies have been deconstructed. People meet in, in clubs and have in their own interests. We are a world of defining more individual interests and then finding the people who have the same individual interests. So um, one thing is, I don't know if you have heard about this, I am, I'm founding a center in Heidelberg, an intercultural center that is supposed to be a platform for people where people can exchange ideas and thoughts and projects together. And I think w these societies need spaces where we engage into not only debate, because debate is somehow sometimes unreconcilable. Sometimes you just can't talk to someone anymore. But maybe you can do something else with that person. And maybe you can build a com common ground on, on another way. And I feel that we have stopped doing that. We have like really isolated. Some people say that the social, the, the thinking and the organization of social media has added tremendously to this because it's a world of you get the news that you want, you get the people that you want, you read the blogs that you want. People used to get news three times a day. It was the same news, so everybody was in actually the same information bubble. And today people build their worlds around the way they want to. So I think how do we create in, in this time the, the common ground? How do we build institutions where we can bear each other though we don't like each other because we form a society together? And, um, and maybe the, how to end this, un, un, it feels like we are somehow at war and everything can't be reconciled. And to go past that, you know, being a Republican and Democrat doesn't mean one is human, one is inhuman, but it has come to be like it's two existential worldviews. And there must be, I mean, I believe in democracy and democracy is not about my or your worldview, it's about the compromise. So I believe we have to find, recreate bigger spaces for the common ground and make the things that make us different. We are somehow stressing the differences because we thought this is individualizing people and giving space to the individual. But I think we have come to a point where we have individuals, but we have too little community and, and creating also a way of behaving and talking that can bring us together instead of apart. reason for that or like is it got has it got something to do with the way that the Soviet uh, covered its district like yeah, you know, the sad thing, it would be at least a smaller problem if it was only in the East, but the sad thing is it is not true. The AFD has also gained almost 15% in in the federal elections in Baden-Württemberg, where, where I come from, and it's the one of the wealthiest states of Germany. And they had actually no need, and they are m one of the most diverse because we sometimes say, like regions like Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, they have only a few percent of uh, foreigners, so they are afraid of foreigners because they don't know them. 
But in the south of Germany, the cities have 25% of um, minorities or people with a um, uh, non-German background. So I, I think that I think, and that's why I came back to Paul Krugman and the fact that he said it's only about race. I feel it is also about economy. That somehow even Baden-Württemberg is wealthy, but too many people do not participate in that wealth. And there is a, an anger, and I also always like to talk to the taxi drivers or to people I buy my food with. I also just to, to figure out what are they thinking. And they were voting for the AFD because it's an, a real alter alternative. They said, I hate the establishment, and they are new. I don't like them, actually, and I don't agree with their policies. I agree with one thing, maybe, but I'll vote for them so the others know that I do not, I do not agree. So mainly we have, I do not agree, but people don't know what they actually want. That's also about the wake up. What is it that's so disturbing? What is it that you don't want? People can't articulate it. And in that gap at the moment, I've, I feel like the AFD has like used that ground to um, promote xenophobia and go against people because they have all those images of the, of the refugees. So they have used the refugee crisis to create that atmosphere. And um, I don't think, I unfortunately don't think it is an East German problem. But the East has more problems with the right extremist structures, from what I have heard. And the, 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 the example that I gave about the Syrian terrorist who killed himself in, in prison is also putting questions on the authorities, like how can you allow a terrorist um, to kill himself? And the psychologist who tested the person to, to figure out if he's um, in danger of suicide, he said he isn't. I mean, the man was a suicidal bomber. And the psychologist says he's not in danger of suicide. So it's very awkward to try to understand what's going on. And, and there seems to be more structural right thinking in the East than in, in the West. But they're also not part of the economic um, prosperity of Germany. The East has been far worse off in, in many areas. And there has been, from, my, from what I know, too little worth with young, uh, work with young people that was working on democratic values, on uh, like spaces where young people would learn about democracy, diversity, and everything. So the, the work with the young people was mainly done by structures that were with another kind of thinking. And now it pays back. I feel that as Europeans, we often feel that something is not right with our European Union. Now, I, I feel a strong allegiance to the European Union, even uh, putting my European identity before any other national identity that I have. Uh, so we feel that something is wrong, but quite often we really cannot exactly name any solutions. How do you, what, what, what solutions for Europe do you see into the future? How would you, I know it's a big question, but uh, you know, basic reforms, what do, you, what, do you think, what do you think could make many people believe in, believe in European ideal, idealism again? Well, I, I said European Union has this tremendous bureaucracy. So what people in Europe um, connect to Europe is that they have managed to give, I mean, make laws for our bulbs. So everybody had to change its light bulbs, and they have to be very different. Many people associate the European Union with something really bureaucratic. They forgot about the deep values and what it is for. So I think one thing that should um, be done in the European Union is to start with the solidarity that it was built on. Like we cannot, um, we have to find a solution about the refugee crisis together, about the economy crisis of the European South together. You know, Europe has far too fast come to a point where it's a Greek problem. You know, though many economists worldwide have said you can't p impose more austerity on Greece, Europe has imposed austerity on Greece, which was a German politics. So I think Europe, Europe has to ask itself if European solidarity means that we are like fostering brain drain to bring intelligent people from the south to the north, or if we are trying to make Spain wealthy again and Italy working again. Somehow the, the nationalist idea is still in front of the common idea. So there's intellectuals who are working on the ideas of a European republic. Like, can you actually think of uh, being a European for real, being a European first, maybe, and then a German? You know, so there is people who are bringing that idea into discussion to strengthen that. But I, I think they, there is a deep economic uh, distrust in the European elites, because people feel they are very well paid, and they don't know what's the outcome of that 
So Europe has to, um, like, lacks transparency in making people see what it's good for. You know, by now they only see Brussels, the bureaucrats, and a well life, right. but they don't communicate what's actually the benefits of Europe, aside from the open borders that we all loved. And, and people have started to talk about the economic effects. And I mean, Euro Europe, by being the European Union, is, as I said, a market bigger than the United States. So they are an economic force together, but they deny to be a political force together. So uh, I think what um, many people are talking about, is there going to be any military operation as a European Union? Is there going to be foreign policy as a European Union? So these are all questions that we have to ask each other, but we don't even know who are the people who are discussing these questions. So one thing to make the European more transparent would be, aside from Schulz and Juncker, very few politicians are actually known. So these people have to be stronger connected to the communities they are coming from, and there's like like the M the the uh, members of parliament in Germany have very strong links to their voters. So I think the people we sent off to Brussels have to be as close to the bases as the people who go to Berlin. So these are I think just one like something to start from, and the deep distrust that these elites are just pushing monies aside and giving fundings to firms that actually exploit the new uh, European countries, like the new European countries like um, Hungary and so on. They have gotten a lot of money from the European Union, but the money that is given to them always, often goes back to German um, companies and so on. So the question is, who is the European Union really helping? I mean, there's a deep distrust about who the European Union is uh, and who, who it is good for. And I think this can only be resolved through more transparency. Follow-up question. Uh, so do I understand correctly that you see further federalization of the European Union as a possible solution? I mean, of course, we have 28, well, soon to be 27, very different systems that are trying to work together. Of course, you are going to need institutions to facilitate that common communication. Maybe reducing the systems to one would be helpful? Not at the moment, because we have so many uh, right-wing um, parties that are actually causing, um, you know, steering up the fears in people that they will lose their national identity. So I think doing that at the moment would be counterproductive. So I don't think at the moment we can take anything national away, but maybe give the nations the feeling that by being together they can also be stronger nations, like this dialectic of development. I don't think we could have done that a few years ago, I think, because people didn't worry that much. But at the moment, they are too worried, and we have too many strong right parties in, in all the European countries that I don't think I would touch on that. I meant eventually in the future. In the future, maybe, but not at the moment. So if, um, thank you, David, coming from Prague for that question. And how do you feel like you're coming here to Providence, to Brown University, the German um, concentrators and the German club has invited you. We think, of, we think you're German. Now, is that, how do you, do you call yourself German? Do you feel German? Is it different when you were 18 and went off to the university? How has that changed, being a daughter of Gast Arbeiter? Well, I, I, I am here as a German. <laughs> so I do think I have, um, I, I, am, I am a German. And, but I am a German in, in my terms. So that means that um, I will not, um, like have my grandparents born there and, and have this super German history. And I maybe don't look like the cliche of German, though there's so many people that don't look like it. I think there's, I mean, for my generation, so many things have changed and we do claim um, a new normality. But I sometimes, I like to play with that because it depends on who you're talking to. There's people who are more shocked when I say I'm German and then there's people who are more shocked when I say I'm not. So since I like to work with provocation, I sometimes prefer to, um, depends on who, you know, some people want me to be German because they want me to represent the new Germany. So then I like to say, no, I don't, I think I'm German, but not, I mean, I could also be Croatian, I could also be anything. So but just maybe I don't like that people are so focused on national identity at the moment, that people are so focused on, on just put, pinning it down and, and who's German, who's not, and when are you German, when are you not. Everything has become quite claustrophobic, I think. So things that were quite natural a few years ago have now become a radical thing of fighting, you know, because as Krugman said, it, 
the world is changing and the old white men figure out it's not their world anymore. So do I want to fight all the time with the old white men? I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm building a world with many, a, a country with many people my age and younger than my, that I find worth living, that we find, that we believe in, uh, in, in democracy, in, in, in human rights and, and debate and transparency. And I like that generation. I said that even the police has tremendously changed. I mean, if, if, if you look at the police in Munich, I, I talked about that. There was a big, big fest going on in Munich, refugees welcome. They were making a huge party. And the police in Munich was like tweeting all the time about the party, about where to go to, what's safe and what's not. And after that party, they said, thanks for that evening. It was a beautiful party. So even the German authorities have changed. I mean, this is the country of former Nazi. And I live in the country where after 70 years, the police manages to find an easy tone. And, and when I speak about diversity, I get letters from policemen. And they say, thank you for saying this, because they always think we are the Nazi German policemen. But I have so many colleagues with Greek, Italian, whatever roots. And you know, I couldn't even work with them, because they provide me with valuable information how to handle my city and how, how to handle some corners. So I think there's Germany's much more um, interesting, vital, and anything than the, the, the political fights going on at the moment. So I, I'm happy if I can represent Germany, because I hope it will do justice and be a motor for all these people who are just like me, who, who want to um, make, make sure that this is the home to the people who live there, and not the home to people who claim they have three-generation German blood in, in themselves. And, um, but my, my Germanness um, always would mean that I'm a world citizen, that I prefer to be, to know that I have, by chance and by coincidence, been born to German to Germany, and to Croatian parents. Everything is just an, a coincidence, and and I'm very very lucky to live in a country with such a great constitution and so many laws and such a great. I mean, it's uh, such a luck that I have done nothing for. So I also feel that I want to give something back to, to this country who has given me that lifestyle and uh, the world. I am. Yeah, I, I hate actually defining myself in a nation-based question. But um, I feel that Germany, since last year, in the last five years, is definitely the country where I want to live. Um, yeah, I, I think we might be um, out of time for questions, unfortunately. But, um, we would but I would prefer to end on a less personal note. because. <laughs> um, uh, maybe if there's one question, one last question. Yeah, yeah, just on that note, maybe. I noticed that you, when talking of Germany, you um, often said the country considered as Germany. So you were kind of, you know, distancing yourself from that, which I found interesting because it seems like you have a critical opinion or kind of, you're kind of suspicious maybe of this act of naming a nation as a nation. Because what is in the name, of course, what is being named by Speaking of Germany, it suggests the name suggests stability or unchangeability. It suggests unity. Uh, but just actually, when you, because you repeated the, and I am German and I would speak of Deutschland probably in my head, but since we're talking of Germany here, um, I hear the many in Germany too. Um, so maybe we could stress that. There's a, the, like the word Germany, of course, uh, maybe voices without knowing it, um, a certain plurality. <laughs> no, no, I think the country considers Germany is like when maybe you have the same problem in the US in the media, the representation of the country has very little to do with what you consider the country to, is to you. So when I look at a German talk show, like for example, Anne Will, you have 80% uh, of the guests are men, old, worried, fearful, and everything's going down and nothing works. And then you leave your house, you have your, your I mean, you feel like the world's okay. You know, and then you feel you feel you feel bad for all those people who aren't, and then you wonder who's steering all that uh, hysteria. And, and 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 many people in Germany, when you look how they live this intercultural life together, you know, people so many German live a live a urban life now. You know, it's like the cities are no longer. You, you go. I mean, you have so many cafes, restaurants, international food. It's it's urbanized. Germany has really changed. And on the other hand, we have talk shows when you feel you talk about Germany in the 80s. So when I see the, the country called Germany, it's maybe because I think we are not so represented that the Germany I talk about is the, the image people have about Germany. 
though the cities in, in numbers are actually the, the Germany I talk about, when you go to school classes, there's now school classes with 60% kids with, from all over the world whose parents came to Germany and they are Germans now. So I want to do justice to that generation of people who just live in another normality and who I wish will not have a backlash now because of the, 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 the rhetoric. And I think that it's still not as known as it feels for me that things have really, really changed and there is a whole... And in the next generation, I've been to a kindergarten writing a play with them. There were 99% of the kids whose parents were not from Germany. So you're just there and the, 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 the teachers are like, I don't know how to integrate them. And I'm just like, well, where do you want to integrate them into? <laughs> I mean, maybe you should integrate yourself into them. Yeah, so it's, um, it's really changing and, and, uh, and to, to not, the wor not to the worst. But the, politics have, uh, the politicians have not understood that it's time to act. And it was maybe too late. They should have done things earlier to make it more normal. So that's, um, that's maybe, I have like written this, maybe last thing, this, um, these speeches and, and essays, it's called Made in Germany. And that's maybe the last note I want to end with because I started with my parents and this generation. The first generation immigrants after the Second World War were people who were meant to come to Germany and work. And they have been denied citizenship, most of them. So they were not citizens back home because they left home and they were never citizens in Germany. I consider that a deep democratic failure because these people have never participated in the country they have aged in and, 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 and lived in and paid taxes in. So um, what I hope for is that they have these people have been the invisible power behind, you know, the German brand made in Germany, like the Mercedes Benz is made in Germany, all the quality was made in Germany. And it wasn't even to me that I, one day I woke up and I was like, well, my parents made these machines. My parents made that, that stuff. And then it's made in Germany, but it's all the immigrants who made that stuff. And it's not, we consider it as German quality and immigrants are somehow not so organized, but it's also the immigrants who, who were made in Germany. And then the title of the book is Made in Germany, like my generation is made in Germany. And we consider ourselves maybe as, we hope to be a contribution of quality products and something that could make Germany a better country or a good country just as well. So thank you for listening.